All right, welcome back to the listener's commentary on the Gospel of Matthew. As we continue our study, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 through 22. It's a very short little section, and yet it contains some incredibly important and powerful teaching about what it means to follow Jesus, what discipleship to Jesus really entails, and who Jesus really is. To remember where we're at, we need to recall that we're in a section that focuses on the theme of Jesus' authority. It flows out of the end of the Sermon on the Mount, where Matthew told us that the crowds were amazed at Jesus' authority. And then he starts this section in chapters 8 and 9 with a series of snapshots of miracles and some teachings. Some more miracles and some teachings. Some more miracles and then a setup into the next big block of teaching. And all of this has to do with Jesus' power and authority. And so the miracle stories that preceded this and the miracle stories that will flow out of this, uh, they demonstrate Jesus' authority, his power over uh, disease and over uh, sickness. And we'll see things over even nature and various things that all demonstrate his authority. But his authority isn't exclusively or even primarily for that. His authority ultimately entails people coming and submitting to him as Messiah and King and becoming his disciples. And so in and amongst those miracle stories are scenes that show Jesus teaching and uh, calling people to discipleship and things of that sort. And so that's what we have here in this short little section. We've just seen a few miracles. Now we get some strong words about discipleship before some more miracle stories. And so this little section is going to teach us some important things about Jesus, his authority, and being his disciple. Look what it says in verse 18. It says, Now, when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to depart to the other side. Recall the setting uh, from chapter 8, verse 17, that Jesus was in Capernaum. He healed the servant of a centurion. Then he healed Peter's mother-in-law. And that led to a whole bunch of people bringing sick people to him or people with various ailments to him, people that were demon-possessed. And he, he healed them all. So the crowds around him are growing, and Jesus decides that it's time to just get away for a little bit. And it's in that setting that two would-be disciples come to Jesus, and Jesus challenges them with the cost of discipleship. So verse 19, the first one comes to him, and it's a scribe. Then a scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Now, in the immediate setting, Jesus is planning on leaving town and getting to the other side. And so this scribe has been impressed with his power and authority. And he says, I'll follow you wherever you go. Remember, a scribe is somebody that is an expert in the ancient scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. And so this guy is trained, particularly in the law and the nuances of that. But he's been impressed by Jesus' power and authority. And so he's coming to him in a pledge of seeming loyalty And Jesus responds to him this way in verse 20. Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes, the birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. The phrase Son of Man, this is the first time it shows up here in the Gospel of Matthew. It'll be used 30 times in the Gospel of Matthew. This is the first. And it derives from the Old Testament. That phrase, son of man, sometimes in the Old Testament, is just a way to refer to a human being. A a son of man is a son of Adam, a human being. But uh, most probably Jesus uses it with specifically Daniel chapter 7 as the background. And in Daniel 7, it is a picture of one who looks like a human being, and yet He's given the very authority of God and sits right next to God on the throne and rules over all things. And so in Daniel 7, the phrase son of man refers to an exalted human being with divine authority. And that's the background and the picture of this word as Jesus uses it for himself. He's not just a son of man. He's the son of man, the one referred to in Daniel 7. But interestingly enough, even though he, he is that exalted, glorified, kingly figure with authority over all things in Daniel 7, even though that's the case, he doesn't have uh, a place to lay his head. Even the foxes have that. Even the birds have nests, but not the son of man. 
And what does he mean by that? Well, technically, when Jesus is in Capernaum, he stays at Peter's house. That's the best we can tell, right? So apparently he sleeps there, but it's not his own place. And I think that's more the sense of what Jesus is getting at by this phrase when he says he has nowhere to lay his head. He's essentially saying to this would-be disciple, are you prepared to be out of place in this world, to be not at home in this current world with the way it works? I mean, this guy that's coming is a scribe, which means he has some status. He has some clout. He has some importance, right? He belongs. So Jesus touches all of that by saying, if you follow me, if you really mean what you're saying, and you really want to follow me wherever I go, you're going to lose that. You're going to be in a position where you don't belong. And the implied question really is, are you game for that? Are you up for that? And so it raises this question for us as well, who would follow Jesus today. Are we prepared to identify with Jesus and his mission and live more as a pilgrim, a traveler, than a settler, to, be, to recognize that we don't belong here. Are we willing to lose status and place and importance and belonging in order to follow Jesus as his disciple? Then another would-be disciple comes to Jesus, and Jesus' response initially seems pretty cold-hearted. Look what happens in verse 21. And another of the disciples said to him, Lord, Allow me first to go and bury my father. So he wants to follow Jesus, but first let me go bury my father. And Jesus' response in verse 22 is, Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. And that seems pretty cold hearted. I mean, it sounds like this guy wants to follow Jesus, but needs to go to his dad's funeral first. And Jesus is just like, dude, if you actually want to follow me, then follow me. You can let other people, dead people, take care of their own dead people. What in the world's going on? Well, at first glance, like we've said, it sounds like a legitimate excuse. My dad died. I need to bury him. And in Jewish piety, burying your father was one of the most important things you could do. In fact, in some writings, it's described as a religious duty that took precedence over all others. It was a crucial way that you kept the command to honor your father and mother. And so this seems like a perfectly legitimate excuse. But what we need to understand is that the phrase, bury my father, does not mean that his dad has just died. Kenneth Bailey points out that the phrase is a way of saying, let me serve my father and fulfill my family obligations first. And then once I've done that and he has died and I've honored him with a burial, I'll come and follow you. And who knows how long that could be. In other words, his dad has not just died. His dad is still perfectly alive, probably perfectly healthy. And what he's getting at is, I need to fulfill my obligation to my father and to my family, take care of my social responsibilities there, honor him by staying in his house, caring for him, being a good son, bearing him when he dies. And when that happens, then I will come and I will be your disciple. In fact, it's obvious to the original readers, at least, that this man's father had not just died because if his father had already died and was unburied, this man would not be on the road near Jesus. He'd actually be at home standing vigil over his father's body until preparations for burial were complete and they had taken care of all of that. So this is an excuse based on social and religious priorities. And certainly Jesus doesn't expect him to set those aside to follow Jesus. Jesus does he, right? Like Jesus doesn't think that he himself is more important than, than family obligations and social responsibility. Jesus doesn't think he's more important than honoring father and mother, does he? Well, indeed, Jesus does. That's why Jesus responds the way he does. When he says, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead, that is the spiritually dead. Those outside of Jesus, they can take care of those responsibility. Now is the time. Now is the day to come and follow me and to enter into and proclaim God's kingdom, God's reign, and God's rule. Following me, Jesus is saying, is more pressing than those family and social priorities. That's huge. That's like a massive statement of importance and authority. So who in the world does Jesus think he is? Well, he's the son of man. 
and the miracles leading up to this little account of, about discipleship and the miracles that are going to follow after it, they all demonstrate that he actually has the power and the authority to command such loyalty. Loyalty that tr transcends one's uh, family, loyalty that transcends one's social obligations, even social obligations to the family. Jesus has the authority and the power to command ultimate loyalty, highest loyalty. And that reminds us that discipleship to Jesus takes precedence over everything else. Discipleship to Jesus takes precedence over security, having no place to lay your head. It takes precedence over comfort. It takes precedence over family and social expectations. It takes precedence even over social proprieties. Jesus' authority is over any and all other authorities. Jesus is over comfort and security. Jesus over social customs and propriety. Jesus is the king, the son of man. And it's not simply enough to say, oh, I believe in you and I'll follow you kind of uh, half-heartedly or when I feel like it. No, you have to submit to him completely. And that's the call and the demand of discipleship. His authority commands our allegiance and our loyalty. All right, thanks for tuning in to this session on the Listener's Commentary. The Listener's Commentary is a listener-supported, crowdfunded Bible teaching ministry that's made possible by the generous support of people just like you. So if you've been blessed or impacted by this ministry in, in any way, would you prayerfully consider, if you're able to join the team of supporters, and you can do so by going to listenerscommentary.com, there's a Give button on that page, and you can click that Give button. It'll redirect you to a page where you can set up a one-time, or you can click a little box that says Make This Monthly, uh, Monthly Recurring Donation. All monthly donors get access to the Study Hub, or you can sign up just through the Study Hub link and get instant access to the Study Hub there as well. Both ways are great ways to support this ministry. So thanks a ton for your support.